series of Walking with Jesus. We are now focused today on this little thought. Is be careful what you wish for. Careful what you wish for. Anybody out here uh, enjoy new things? I do. Something new is always a little fun at first. And our world is full of stuff, right? Stuff that is always better when it's new and shiny and attractive. And so you have new cars and you have new clothes and we have new sneakers and a new washer and dryer. A new apartment. And so there's that sense when something is new like, mm, yes, this is so exciting, this is so great. And then time passes. And that new always seems to wear off, doesn't it? I'll never forget when I was uh, younger and I was have, I had a, a car, maybe I was maybe in my late teens, early 20s, and it was like my first car, it's really just a, a little thing, you know, but it was, it got me here to there. And I remember my mom saying something like this, you know, son, everything that you have is one day going to be trash. Now, she wasn't, like, you know, stamping on my enthusiasm. She was just giving me a reality check that even though I was, you know, a 19-year-old and had a car, it's like, so what? You don't put your hope in stuff that's going to one day be in the trash. And so the question comes, then, how is it that we are to live in this world and have the right attitude and heart toward the world? Because it's tough. It's not easy to say, well, I got it all together. I have a perfect attitude. It's, it's a subtle thing. It's, sometimes it's a very deceiving kind of thing. In our series in the book of John, John, in chapter 2, we're now in he had reminded God's people, us, today as well as back then, he had reminded us about the best things in life. Okay? And he talked about uh, you know, God's best for us in chapter 2. Uh, things like forgiveness, uh, fellowship, victory that we have in Christ. And now, what I'm going to read to you today is a warning that he gives. Because victory that we have in God is not just something that's mindless and automatic. We have to pursue this. We have to be willing to allow God to change our hearts. Because there is a world that we live in. We are people who are in bodies and we live in a physical world and sometimes what happens is, is the world can pull us away from God, Amen. from the, the presence of God, from the victory that we should have in Christ, just from uh, life itself. We can be just pulled away from what real life is about. So John writes these words to us that I'm going to read to you right now about how to experience victory. How to not just, you know, say that we're Christians, but how to guard our hearts so that we truly are followers of Christ. Here we go. Are you ready for God's Word? Yes. Alright, here's what the Word says. Everybody listening? Yep. Guys, okay? 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. I would like to have you read it with me. Okay? Let's all read it together. You ready? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the 
flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Can you say amen? Amen. amen? amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the word. If you're taking notes and you want to write this down, this is what we're talking about. Okay. Live for what lasts. Don't accept cheap substitutes in life. Go after the best. Go after what God has given to us that will last. Now, how do we do this? John, from the Bible, tells us, through these verses we just read, we are to experience victory in this life, but we have to be careful that we don't live or love the world. Verse 15 tells us very clearly, do not love the world or the things in the world. Now how different is this from the message that we get in our culture every single day. Okay? There's a vast difference. And so in order to understand what John is challenging us here, we have to understand some of the key words. What does it mean to love? When John says, do not love the world, what does he mean by that? When we love something, it's not just talking about like, you know, I love chocolate pudding, or you know, it's not just something like fri friv frivolous <laughs> and superficial. It's talking about our heart's affection. When you love something, you put your hope in something. You're, uh, you're devoted to that. And in a real sense, we, when we love someone or something, it's sort of like we're serving them. And not all love is wrong, of course. But the love of the world is basically a serving of things that are you know, not of God. We put our hope and affection upon things that God has said, I deserve. So, we have to understand, you know, love is very important because our God, he's a jealous God. I don't, I don't see him as a, you know, like a, a teenage uh, situation where, you know, everybody's just jealous for no reason at all. You know, there's all this drama all the time in some people's relationships. No, but God is a God, he's a holy God, but he's a jealous God, and he wants our hearts. And he wants our love because he loves us so intensely. So he tells us don't love the world. And we have to then ask ourselves, what does the Bible mean by world? Okay, so we talked about what the Bible means by love. But what does the Bible mean by the world? So the, the word world in the Bible is the word where we get cosmos from. Cosmos. You've heard that word, you know, cosmopolitan, person of the world. Okay, the cosmos. Now, in order to understand in the Bible what the word is talking about, we have to read the words around it. That's called the context. Because every single word in the Bible has a neighborhood that lives in it. And when you understand the neighborhood, you understand the word. So, to understand the word world, we have to just see what's around it. Because sometimes the word world means something different in one place than somewhere else. I'll give you an example of that. In the book of John, chapter 1, verse 10, this is talking about Jesus. All right, Look at the references to the world here. He, Jesus, was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And so here we have different concepts of the word world. You notice uh, here 
that the Bible says the world was made through him. Well, this is talking about created world, right? The earth. You know, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But yet here, in this last line, the world did not recognize him. That's not talking about the created world, like, well, trees didn't recognize him or rocks didn't recognize him. No, that's talking about the world of people, persons. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? So let's understand that sometimes the word world means creation. In fact, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, talks about from the foundation of the world. So again, created things. God's the creator. Sometimes the word world means people. How many of you have ever heard that verse? For God so loved the world. What is he talking about there? He's talking about people. Now it would be confusing if the world meant the same thing every single time in the Bible because God is saying here that with the scriptures that we read in 1 John, the Bible says, do not love the world. And yet, John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. But you see, there's different concepts brought out between creation, between people. But there's also a third way of understanding the world as brought out in the Bible. And this is the word that has to do with the world that is broken and fallen and rebellious against God. The world as a world system. Now, we sometimes hear people say things like, the world of sports. How many of you have heard that phrase before? How about the world of fashion? Or the, the world of money from Wall Street? When we say that as an expression, like the world of sports, we're recognizing that it's like a, a system, right? It's an organized kind of system that is different from the rest of the world in that sense because it has to do with sports and teams and, and so on. The word world has to do with something that is organized. All right? That's even from the very word itself. It means something that's been kind of like a system put together. Whether we realize it or not, there is a system that's all around us that is in opposition to God himself and what God wants to accomplish in people's lives. It's a system that first seems to be very chaotic, but there's an organization behind it. It's like the idea of guerrilla warfare. If two uh, armies are fighting each other, but one army uh, has ceased to be like, you know, like this mass of people, but they're all broken up and they're all in guerrilla warfare, they're still fighting and they still have a sense of organization, but it's different. So what I'm saying to you is that there is a world that we live in that is fiercely opposed to God. Not only wanting to leave God out, we see that in our society all over the place. You know, most people believe in God, that, you know, yes, there's a creator. I mean, look at around you. Most people will just common sense tells them that something physical has to come from something that's not physical. Most people understand that and believe that. But yet, we live in a culture that pushes God outside. No, we don't want any mention of God in our politics. We want to kick him out of our schools. We don't ever want him to be ever mentioned in the world of science. You know, even though the beauty of God's creation is everywhere. It's sort of like an organized rebellion that says we don't want God ruling over us. I will do my own thing in life. Thank you very much if there is a God, who cares? You see, there's this mindset, this world spirit that opposes God. Okay, That's the way that the Word of God uses that term when, we, when John says, do not love the world. Okay? Now, the Bible tells us that if we as believers in Jesus 
if we <coughs> slacken or you know just kind of drift from our relationship with God and put our affection just upon the things of this world and the things are not evil in themselves, you know, this is not evil. But if we put our, all of our attention and our focus on things, then what happens is, is we're committing spiritual adultery. You know, God is a faithful God. He, he saves us. He loves us. We're like married to Him in spirit. But if we love the world instead of God, then we're, we're committing adultery. We're just saying, God, you're not enough for me. I, I need to get into the world. I need to go ahead and uh, you know, let the world captivate me. Let the world satisfy me, which it never does anyway. But that's what we're saying. So, even worse than that, if we love the world, then what's happening is, is that we're actually siding with the enemy against God. That's how serious it is. James tells us this. The Bible says here in the Word, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay, so I've gone a little quickly, but let me back up with the, with the question so you can write it down. What happens if we love the world? We're committing spiritual adultery, and we're also siding with the enemies of God. That's why verse 15 says, If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so God loves us, and he wants to pour out his love upon us, but if our affection and our devotion is just simply this world, then we miss out on that, you know, that love relationship that God wants to have with us. Now here's what I was talking about when we become enemies with God. James chapter 4 and verse 4. Friendship with the world is hostility with God. Now, as I've been thinking about these verses... I've been asking myself, you know, how much of this world do I love <clears throat> compared to my love for God? Because every single one of us, we are all influenced by the world in which we live a lot more than we realize. And so I'm checking myself to say, Lord, uh, do I really love you? And how do I prove that? For, like, for example, if I say that I love God and I, I take His authority seriously and His Word changes my life, but yet consistently every day I can watch sports for three hours, I can do what I want to do and entertain myself, but then at the end of the day I realize, well, I've never even considered His Word at all. I didn't read it, didn't think about it. I hardly even focused on prayer. You understand what I'm saying? How the world suddenly it's, it's, it deceives us and creeps in and takes over our whole thought life. And how is it that we can, you know, watch television, which so much of it is anti-God, hours and hours and hours, and yet when it comes to prayer or getting together with God's people, it's like, oh, you know, I don't really want to do that, or that's not really that exciting to me. You see what I'm saying? The, the world dulls our love for God and deadens our desire to know Him. So we have to, again, be aware of this. And part of this awareness is like, God, you have to renew me. Help me to love you and not love the world. Okay. Are you guys with me? I'm not, I'm not trying to get like a big stick and try to beat you. John wasn't trying to beat the believers, but he just recognized that this world battle that we're all in is so real. It's very powerful. And if we're not aware of it, we just get swept away. That's why many people today, here's the problem, many people today in our culture just accept American culture as normal. 
So we just, you know, we just suck it in every day. We just eat it in every day. And then we wonder why when we look around in America and we see Christians that live no differently than anybody else. Same kind of addictions, same kind of problems, same kind of marital, you know, bouncing from one person to the next to the next to the next. You understand? It's like, what's going on? Why, why are not... Why are we not more, why are we not more different? Why are we trapped? Could it be because that we love the world and we don't even realize it? Okay. Now, I grew up in a, a church that was a called uh, Assemblies of God, which this church is. And this church emphasized Jesus Christ. I'm so happy about that. And they also what was a it was a Pentecostal church, and it was called Pentecostal because the church believed in the gifts of the Spirit and believed in what's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit or getting more of the Holy Spirit into you. We believed those things. Okay? There was also uh, when I was growing up a lot of teaching concerning the difference between the world and going after God. And sometimes what happened is is that there were emphases that were maybe overzealous and over extreme all right for example not so much in my life but a lot of Pentecostals that I have met uh, emphasize a lot of the external like differences like you know making sure that you uh, dress a certain way uh, there was even a time when uh, Pastors would preach from the pulpit about you know the evil of going to a bowling alley, you know, and we kind of chuckle at that now because we see that that was a really major emphasis on the external. And we also I saw growing up where my uncle was a, uh, a pastor, and he was caught up in uh, you know we would even think of it almost as legalism in the sense that. Uh, the people that came to his church, the ladies would never be allowed to wear any slacks or any kind of jeans because that would be uh, like, you know, seemingly like dressing like a man. Uh, and so there was a distinction there. And I know today we look back at that and we say, oh, you know, that they were way off. Uh, and yes, you can be way off with just emphasizing the externals when it comes to the world. You can't really get far off on that. But the important thing is, is that we have to recognize that every one of us has to make decisions about how the world's going to affect us and how we're going to be different from the world. You see, if we just throw out the whole teaching of difference and separation, just throw it all the way out, then again, we're just no different than anyone else. And there's no real witness that we have because we're caught up in the same problems and difficulties and sins like everyone. So there has to be a difference. That's what John is teaching here. So he's not saying, you know, I'm going to give you a list of a thousand things and this is how you're going to be different. Because that would have never lasted, you know, from the first century till now. You know, never lasted. But he's saying, we all have to seek God and say, how am I going to be different than the world? How am I going to love God and not love this world? So there's an expression that has helped me a lot. When I look at people like my uncle, who preached about you know, women's clothing and so on, my uncle was an amazing person of prayer. I mean, there were so many good things about him. So I'm not going to look back and say, oh, my uncle, he was just such a jerk. He just didn't, you know. No, he was a man of God. He really was. I think he got a few things wrong, maybe too extreme, but he really was a man of God. And so here's what I've adopted as an attitude about the past. Here it is, from the altars of the past. Okay, this is the altars that my you know, ancestors lived. And people from back in the assemblies of God in, in times, generations past. From the altars of the past, keep what? The fire. Keep the fire. There's so many good things in their heart that they love God. And they were passionate. Keep the fire, but lose the yeah. Okay. It's sort of like the idea, you know, you, you, you chew on the meat, but you spit out the bones. That's kind of the same idea, all right? So 
Keep that in mind. We don't just say, oh, it was all wrong. No, we say there's a lot of right that they did. We're, many of us are here today because of their faithfulness and their witness. Amen. So I appreciate that. All right. Now, here we go. Live for what lasts. Number two, remember what the world is all about. Okay, don't forget. This is not, a, you know, this world is not our eternal home. It's not even a friendly environment when it comes to God. So, remember what the world's all about. Here's what John says. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So, The world, again, we define that as the system that we're in, in life, that is opposed to God. It's like the whole brokenness and fallenness of our uh, you know, of people, created beings. So, the first thing we look at, all that's in the world, the desires of the flesh. The world is about you following your cravings. It's like whatever you desire, then it must be okay because you're desiring it, so give in to it. If you want it, go after it. If it's something that's illegal or immoral, so what? You're desiring it. And after all, isn't life all about you? You see, that's the message that we get. Constantly. And so if we're going to love God, we have to understand how to deal with the desires that we have, many of which those desires are would take us down a pathway we don't want to go. All right? The word desires here, this word cravings, is the word sarx in the Greek, which means flesh, fleshly. Not necessarily just flesh and bone. It's not talking about evil, our bodies being evil, it's talking about that our inclinations. For example, uh, when somebody is rude to you, usually our first inclination is to be rude back, right? And so that's like, that's like the flesh in operation. It's like, well, you know, if you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. So the flesh is all about you know, us just giving in to any thought and any urge that we have. That's a very dangerous way to live. And people ruin their lives by just giving in to the flesh, giving in to the flesh, giving in to the flesh. We have to live above. I am going to be going to India in two weeks. And um, I'll be leaving next Sunday to go to Africa. But then the next Sunday after that, I'll be in India preaching. I've been studying some, some of uh, literature on India, kind of refreshing my memory. Uh, India has 1.4 billion people in an area of about a third of the United States. It's, it's incredible the amount of people that are there. And uh, their predominant religion is Hinduism, although Buddhism has a large uh, population, as well as the Muslim population. It's a, a very dangerous country for Christians. There's more martyrdom that's happening in India than anywhere else in the world. Now, I've been studying about Buddhism specifically because if I meet a Buddhist uh, on the plane or whatever, I want to be able to follow me on this a little bit. We're talking about cravings. The Buddhist religion teaches that if you're, if you, um, that the source of all suffering in the world, this is what Buddha taught, the source of all suffering in the world is because of desires and cravings. That's what he taught. And he gave an eightfold pathway. He, he said, you know, it's right thinking, it's right motives, it's right actions. It's the eightfold path of Buddhism to get out of this, you know, place of cravings. And the ultimate goal of a Buddhist is to come to an experience of enlightenment where you're kind of like, reach nirvana, where you're in a place where you don't have any desires at all. In fact, uh, the Buddhists speak about 
the extinction of the soul. Like you become nothing. Now, there are some things that are true about that, but there's some things that are very false about that. Yes, desires are often a cause of great suffering. But here's the thing. The whole premise of Buddhism is that you just want to become, uh, into, you want to come into a place where you cease to exist. Where in Christianity, you don't seek after extinction, you seek after Christ to come into your life to fill you. Not just to be empty to become nothing, but to be filled to become like Jesus. That's the huge gap between Christianity and Buddhism. So I share that with you because all over the world, people recognize that cravings and desires can get us into a lot of trouble. So like align your cravings with his. So align yes. your desires with his desires. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the world is about capturing your attention. So the Bible says, don't love the world, know the things that are in the world, because the things that are in the world, the lusts of the flesh, or the desires of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes. Okay? The scripture talks about our eyes. The eyes are the entrance into the soul. So what you feast upon with your eyes, then you get drawn to. Now, I was at a restaurant, it was a few years ago, and these people really knew what they were doing. Very smart. <laughs> so you're in the restaurant, and you buy a meal, and fine, you pay the money. But they also want you to buy expensive desserts. Okay? They didn't just have a menu on the dessert uh, you know, table. They didn't just have a menu on the table that you could ignore. When it was time and your meal was finished, they brought the desserts out on a tray. Now, many people probably would have passed with them if the waitress or waiter said, would you like a dessert? Nah, no thanks. But when they have the tray and they bring it in front of you and you see that chocolate mousse and you see that cheesecake, it is like, wow. I was going to say no, but you know what? I'm going for it. Why? Because we see it. There's something about seeing. If you don't believe that, why are billions of dollars spent today on advertising? You can't do anything in life without being thrown advertising in your face. Isn't it annoying? You know, you go on your computer, you have to always delete, always delete. You watch television, you watch an, an hour show, and you probably have 15 minutes of advertising. You know, it's just ridiculous. You just go down the street and everything's thrown at you forever. Why? Because they're catching your eye. And if they can catch your eye, there's a chance that they got your attention. And the real motive is to take the money that you have out of your pocket and put it into their pocket. Okay. So, capturing your attention. Just, just be aware of how important it is you know, for what you see. God made us as men as visually oriented. That's why the pornography industry is so exploded. Because of the capturing of attention of the eye. So, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and what does the Bible say? The pride of life. The world is about exalting yourself. Why exalt God when you can exalt yourself? After all, you're such a great person, you're so smart. And of course, you're going to live forever, right? I mean, you know all about these things. Wasn't it at the very beginning, Eve, who was given so much, both Adam and Eve, they were given so much, but there was one thing that God said, I don't want you to touch. God had a right to give them a boundary, and he did. And yet, the Bible says when Eve saw the fruit, that it was that was pleasant, and it was something that would make her wise, okay, here we have, yeah, you know, Satan tempted her by saying, God knows that in the day that you eat it, you will become like God. So why serve a God when you can become a God? That's the message 
of the flesh. So the flesh is all about just exalt yourself. You be the judge of what's right and what's wrong in life. Don't let God tell you anything. You just be your own little God. So the whole world system is built upon this. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The very word in the Bible here, pride of life and boasting, is, it comes from a word of a man back in those days, people that would travel from town to town, and they would just tell all these stories about how great they were. And they couldn't stay very long because they'd be found out as phonies, and so they had to go to the next town. So boasting is basically living in a fantasy world because we're really not all that. Okay? Sorry to burst your bubble, but you're not the greatest person in the world. Neither am I. Godless. And what about the world? What are we supposed to understand about the world? The world is passing away. All right, I love, uh, you know, the city of Philadelphia, the people. I love highway, the people. But the city of Philadelphia, <coughs> and even this church here, Highway Tabernacle, one day is just going to be dust. That's all it's going to be. It's just going to pass away. The word pass away doesn't mean just future. It means it's in the process of decay right now. We live in a world where things break down. And so why do we get so upset? I know I do. Oh, man, you know, the toaster's broken. Well, is that going to live forever? No, you're going to expect that it's going to break down. The water heater just went. Well, it was working for 10 years, and, you know, it's going to break down sometime. So we just, you know, we get so upset and surprised when things break down, but that's life. Oh, I got another aching pain in my knee. Well, I am not, you know, reverse aging here, right? So it's a passing away. I know that sounds kind of depressing, doesn't it? <laughs> the world and its desires pass away. So what do we need to do? We need to keep the goal in mind. All right, this is the good part. If you've been a little asleep because of getting up early, please pinch yourself right now. Okay, this is the part you need to really go home with. So what does the Bible say? The world, okay, let's have a wake up call here. Ready with me? Ready? The world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. Okay, you see that word man there? It's generic. It means person. Okay? The person, man, woman, young person, who does the will of God lives forever. Keep the goal in mind. What's the goal? What did Jesus say was the most important commandment? Love the Lord your God. Don't put anything else ahead of God. Always, He will be our first love. God, I want to be faithful to you because God is faithful to me. Isn't God faithful? Yeah. He is faithful to you. So all He's asking from us is us to be faithful back to Him. Do the will of God. You can do the will of God. It's not that hard. Some people say, oh, I have no idea. You know, sometimes we just, we don't know the will of God. But we just walk in what we do know. And the will of God will become evident. I was uh, at the health club, I think Friday night. I have pretty, you know, people that are in the world probably think I have a pretty boring life. You know, Friday night, you're at the gym. But most of the times on Friday night, at least for maybe an hour and a half. And so I'm at the gym and I have this one exercise that I do where I take some weights and I, I work on my shoulders and I push them above my head. And I was just getting started and I thought, oh man, today this seems heavier than normal. 
I don't, I don't think I can do 13 of these. So that's what I do, 13. I do 12 plus 1 to make myself feel better. <laughs> so I said to myself, you know what? I can't. I can't do 13, but I can do 1. <laughs> so I did 1. After I did 1, I said, you know, I can't do 12 more, but I can do 1 more. I did 1. 1. 1. And I did 13 of them. Why? I can't do it all at once. Right? But I can do one. It's just like God's will. I don't know what his will is for the rest of my life, and I cannot do the will of God for the rest of my life right now. But I can do God's will today. Right now. I can receive the grace of God to do his will right now. And that's all that really matters. Right? So, God's will. As St. Elsa from way back when once said, God's will, nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. That's pretty good advice. Yes. Do the will of God. <laughs> Set your affection on things above, and not on the things of this world. And enjoy. Do you think that God is saying to us, Avoid the sins of the flesh. Avoid the lust of the eyes because I want you to have a miserable life. I want you to be down and I want you to be angry in life and I want you to have a difficult, just hard. No, God tells us all these things so that we can have a joyful life. Oh, I know, I'm missing out so much, you know. I realize that. But because I'm not dead drunk on Saturday night, I realize I just miss out on so much fun. Because I watched my dad have all this fun. After he drank, he'd hang over the toilet and puke his guts out. Oh, that was such a wonderful thing. No, he had so much fun. I watched him, you know, when he would you know, be angry and throw dishes across the room and, you know, have, to have my mom and his kids have to leave the house for three days at a time. Oh, because drinking is a lot of fun. It's just you know, such an enjoyable thing. You see, the world doesn't have the answers. And even if they try to smoke it in, or you know, drink it in, or drugs, or the, you know, the, the, the immorality, it just doesn't ever satisfy. So God wants us to do His will just so that we can enjoy Him and enjoy life. And guess what? Enjoy it forever. Mm -hmm. Man, I just, Amen. You can't beat that. So, last thing I want to leave you is this. Be careful what you wish for. Because if you wish for, hey, I'd like to be a party person, you know, have people just really uh, you know, just look up to me as something really great, and I want to have, you know, make myself feel good with the drugs, and I want to have, mm -hmm. be careful what you wish for, because you can get what you wish for, but it's like, you know, going to a cave and taking a rope. You know, oh, I want that. But you gotta, you gotta, you got to realize that something on the other end of the road comes out of the cave. And you get that too. So be really careful what you wish for. The year that I was born, I know it was a long time ago, 1956, was the same year that as I was coming into the world, five people were going out of the world. These were five young men that had just graduated from college. Some of them were like newly married, had one little baby. These five men were so in love with Jesus that they went to a country called Ecuador. And it was a remote area. They had a little beat up plane. They flew it onto a beach. And they tried to reach out to the Indians uh, of Ecuador. And the Indians didn't know what to take of it. They came out of the woods. And some of the men came out with spears. And they killed all five of these guys. That was in 1956. They killed them. The news came back to America, and many people had the attitude, wow, these guys really wasted their life. They left behind them, you know, wives and children, and what a, what a tragedy. But you know, from this experience, these wives were so filled with Christ, they actually went back to that area and actually ministered to the same people that killed their husbands. There's a picture you can Google of one of the wives sitting down giving a haircut to one of the guys that killed her husband. 
And now that tribe in Ecuador has more Christian than not. And here's the point. Jim Elliott, one of the martyrs that was killed, he wrote this before he died. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. If you live like that, you win. You win. 